Okay, so law of cosines is what we ended with last time, right? How'd y'all feel about that? Should we do one more example, or let's try let's try one of these? So I'm going to present this problem in, in a slightly different way than I did in the past. So as an example, we want to solve solve this triangle. Let's go with a is three, little a is three. Little c is 2, and capital B is 110 degrees. So that's, that's the way this problem appears in the book. I just picked one out of the book. So you're supposed to solve the triangle. So if, if I were going to be doing this problem, <clears throat> going off of what I did last time, I would list out like A, B, C, and then capital A, capital B, capital C, and just kind of fill things in. A is 3, C is 2. All right. So I just wanted you to see the way it's presented in the book does not look like what I did in class. I didn't give like a, they don't give you like a little table to fill out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it into this, that way we can kind of identify what we need to do. So can we, can we use law of signs here? Mm -mm. No. So law of cosines. Now, what should we go after? Little b. Little b, why? Because you already have big b. I have big b, all right? So if you go back and you look at the <clears throat> formula, That's the law of cosines. There were three of them, weren't there? Notice that to find little b, you need to know what big B is. And that's kind of going to lead you to knowing from this, look, I've got big B, so I can go get little b so long as I have A and C, which we do. So we plug in, and we head off to the races here. So we have A squared, which is 9 and then plus c squared, which is 4, minus 2 times 3 times 2 cosine of 110 degrees. Is that all OK? Y'all said y'all really enjoyed this last time. Yes. Yes, you did. That you, that you felt like this was pretty straightforward and, yeah? Is that safe to say? Okay, so let's uh, finish this up. B squared, 9 plus 4 minus 12 cosine of 110. So we'll get our calculators out. We will make sure we are in the appropriate mode, right? You need to be in degree mode. And we'll do the computation here. I'm getting B squared is approximately 17.1-ish. And then take the square root of that. About 4.14, 4.13, close enough, right? So B is 4.14. And then we go the rest of the way. How do, how do we do the rest of this? Did you not get it? Are you in degree mode on it? You could be hallucinating today. You could be, yeah. At, at this point, what would you do next? I mean, would you, to get the other ones, to get everything else? Probably law of signs, right? Law of signs. Do you want me to continue and finish it? It's your call. This is your, yes, yes. it's your, uh, 
Yes, we have enough yeses. I know, I know we have some no's, but I'll do just this last one, all right? And then we're gonna do something new. All right, so if I wanted to find capital A, I would do sine of capital A over little a equals sine of capital B over little b. That would be law of sines, right? And so I'd multiply both sides by 3 and divide by 4.14 and take the sine of 110. I'm getting sine of A must be point, about 0 .68, 0 .681 if you want. Anyone else getting that? Yeah. Now what? Arc sine, uh-oh. Arc sine is dangerous, right? Arc sine is dangerous. So I take arc sine of the left, arc sine of the right, Right, so I'm doing arc sine of that answer. So this thing is spitting out 42.92 degrees. Y'all getting that on here, on your calculator? Remember, that's not the only answer, though. If we go back and think about this, 42 degrees is somewhere over here, right? You could also have had the same y-coordinate, right? 0.681, that's the y-coordinate. Could have happened here. What's that angle? What's this angle right here? It would be 180 minus the 42, right? So it would have to be 137.08 degrees. Now, I can throw that out, can't I? I can throw this out as a possibility because Angle B is already 110 degrees. So there's no way that angle A could be um, 137. It could be 42.92, but that makes it uh, over 180, right? So we can scrap that one. So this has to be 42.92. And then once we have that one, we don't need to do any more law of sines or cosines or anything else, right? Because these three have to be added up to 180. So we just put them together. Oh, I can't. Twenty-seven point zero eight degrees. We have solved the triangle. Any questions? What was that thing I said you should you should probably do once you solve the triangle just to kind of verify that everything looks right? Check the sides and the angles. Yeah, check, check the sides and angles. Make sure they correspond. Biggest angle should go with biggest side. Uh, smallest angle should go with smallest side, and it looks it looks good. All right, that's it. We've got law of sines. We've got law of cosines. We're moving on. If somebody gives you three sides of a triangle without any angles, you use law of cosines. We did that, I did one example last class, right? So just keep that in mind. Now this next section is actually not in our calendar, but I, I just wanna talk about a few things out of this section that I think will come up, they come up in Cal 1, so wanna be clear, make sure you understand that you've seen this, been exposed to it. Let's take an arbitrary triangle again, and let's call the sides, let's go with angle A, which makes that little a, angle B, which makes that little b, angle C, which makes that little c. There's an arbitrary triangle. Now we've already learned, I don't know, somewhere way back in like elementary school, what the area of a triangle is. And what you're told is that if you know this, this height of this triangle, that the area of this triangle is what? One half of base times height. 
Are you all comfortable with why that's true? I mean, I think with the right triangle, if you have a right triangle, I think everyone's comfortable with the idea that if this is the height and this is the base, then the area is half of this times this, right? Because if you did the whole thing, it'd be a rectangle, and the area of a rectangle would be twice as much, right? So you half it, but why does it work for something like this? I, I, I'll convince you real quick, all right? Because it's pretty, it's pretty easy to convince you. I think it is easy. Let's see, take that triangle, here it is, right? And what I want you to do is, is right-click, copy, right? That's what you do on your mouse. Right-click, copy, and then right-click, paste. So I've got another copy of this triangle sitting here. I'd like to take it and I'd like to rotate it. Turn it over. So if I turn that over, I'm trying to turn it over mentally, it would look like, like that, wouldn't it? So I made a copy of it, basically just rotated it and put it there. Got it? Now what I'd like to do is get your scissors out and I'd like for you to cut this edge of the triangle off. Got it? I take, take that and put it right here. Okay, so now that's gone. Now this is your height, right? And look at this side from here to here was the base of the triangle, wasn't it? So if I multiply base times height, this is a rectangle that gives you the area of the whole thing. But this was two copies of the triangle, so you half it. So it works for any arbitrary triangle also. You just have to do some weird sort of cut and paste thing. All right, so we're all satisfied with that? Yes? All right, well, the problem with this formula is that you have to know the height, right? You have to know the height. And a lot of times in triangles, we don't have the height. So th is there another formula that we can use that does not require this purple piece right here? And it turns out that there is. This is also, there is another formula for area that says that it's one half A B sine C. That's the formula. That's kind of weird, but it's saying that if we take this, this side right here, multiply it times this side, right, A times B, and then multiply that times sine of the angle between those two sides, and then take half of it, that's the area of the triangle. And that, that should seem a little awkward that that's true, but it is. So I can, I can actually show you why that's true, and it's very easy to show you it's true, all right? So here's what I'd like for you to do. Take a look, take a look at this uh, triangle here. Let's keep the H here for right now. And just, I'm gonna ask you, what is sine of C? Tell me what sine of C is off this triangle. What is sine of C? It would be opposite, which is H over A, right? This is H over A? Okay, if I tell you to solve this for H, you would multiply both sides by A, wouldn't you? So you get A, sine of C is what H is. Yes? Now come to this formula right here, H, this formula, and replace H with A sine C. And what would you get? You get one half B times A sine C, which is one half A B sine C, which is this formula, right? So it works. It's just a simple application of this. So you somehow eliminate that H from the problem completely, but you actually pick up a trig function in the process. This is very useful in calculus, right? Because you don't need to actually find the height. Good? Okay, there's another formula for area. And this formula doesn't even require any angle at all. It actually requires just three sides of the triangle. If you give me three sides of a triangle, I can tell you the area. And this has a very special name, this formula. It's called Heron's formula. I have bad news about Heron's formula, though. It's not a formula that is easily remembered, all right? Here's what it is. You ready? <laughs> See, I don't even... I, I got to double check just to make sure, yep. It's the square root of S times A minus, no, S minus A. See, I've already messed it up. S minus A 
times S minus B times S minus C. That's Heron's formula. I told you you could use this formula if you have three sides of the triangle. What are the three sides of that triangle? ABC, right? So what the heck's S? Right? What's S? Oh, well, S, there's a, there's a formula for you to get S. S is actually, I believe, half of A plus B plus C. Let me just double check that. But I'm pretty sure it's what it is. Yeah. It's half of the sum of all the sides. What? OK. Let's, let's actually do an example. I'm, I want to do an example, one example of this one and one example of this one. All right? That way you, you can at least have seen it before. So as an example, um, let's say that I give you a triangle. Tell you that this side is 4, that this side is 7, and this side is 7. And I'm going to go a little bit further. Well, no, let's just do that. Let's just start with that one. So I want to find the area. So do you see that uh, doing the 1 half base times height thing is not going to fly here? Because you don't have the height. Now, could you get the height? Could you find the height of this triangle? You could probably drop a perpendicular down here. And you would know that this would be 2, right? Only because it's 7 and 7. So if that wasn't 7 and 7, this wouldn't work. But you could probably get the height. But I'm trying to avoid it, all right? I just am going to use the sides. So which formula would you want? The, the traditional, the one that involves an angle, or the one that involves just all the sides? Herons. The sides, right? I mean, it's obvious. So let's just, let's just calculate some things here. What is S going to be for us? One half of A plus B plus C. So I haven't labeled these, right? So why don't we label them A, B, and C. So this is half of 4 plus 7 plus 7. Which is? What is it? Nine? OK. Who said niner? Is that military background speaking? You know why they use niner instead of nine? In World War II, radio, radio chat over the you know, pilots, you would intercept German um, radio chat, and nine means no in German. And so you wouldn't want to confuse an American pilot saying nine, like, look at your nine o'clock, versus a German that was saying no, like, shit. <laughs> you know, so it was just to distinguish between those two. Interesting. So S is 9. Did you know that during World War II, we took, we, um, we tried to deceive the Germans quite a bit. We did a lot of things to deceive them. But one of the things I found interesting is that we took a dead guy, one of our own dead guys, OK? We dressed him up like a very important guy. And we put a, a handcuff to briefcase to him and threw him out of an airplane onto the ground over in occupied German territory with the briefcase full of a bunch of fake documents. And they found them. And it, just that sort of thing. We did that sort of thing to try and confuse them. That's kind of donate your organs or get thrown out of an airplane with a briefcase attached to your wrist. I don't know. What do you want? <laughs> OK. Um, S is 9, right? I'm losing track here. Come on. Y'all got to keep me going here. OK. S is 9. Root, OK, here we go. It's going to be root 9, and then 9 minus 4, then 9 minus 7, then 9 minus 7, which is going to be 9 times 5 times 2 times 2. 
420, 180? Root 180, whatever that is, okay? That's the exact answer, root, root 180. Do you see how Heron's formula works? I mean, it, it, a lot of this is just plugging things in, but you just, you, you needed to, I wanted to make sure you knew the formula exists for this, all right? Now let's see the other one. I want, I want to do something with the, uh, the middle formula. How about I phrase this next problem from a calculus perspective? And let me, before I actually phrase it, let's, let me just try, try to preempt this with, with, a, with an expression. What if I told you this? This is 2x, this is a rectangle. This is 2x and this is x plus 3. Then can you give me a formula, find a formula for the perimeter? Okay, so what would be the perimeter of this, this rectangle? P equals 2x plus, it's just, yeah, okay, I, yeah, I see what you were going to say. I'm just going to do it all the way around. So it's basically I'm going 2x plus x plus 3 plus 2x plus x plus 3. So just I'm adding up the sides all the way around, right? Yes? And then this would be, um, how many x's? x, four of them, 6x plus 6, is that right? My arithmetic, yeah, 6x plus 6. So that's the perimeter. You tell me what's, what x is and I'll tell you what the perimeter is. Yes? Okay. That's just to get you thinking. Here's the calculus problem. I need a visual aid. Here we go. I have a wire here, okay? And this wire has a length of L, all right? What I'm gonna do with this wire is I'm going to cut it somewhere, all right? So I'm gonna pick somewhere and I'm going to cut it. And from what I cut off, I'm going to bend the wire into a circle, got it? With the, re with the wire that remains, I'm going to take that and bend that into an equilateral triangle. Make sense? So I'm going to have two different objects. I'm going to have a circle and I'm going to have an equilateral triangle. Make sense? So if I cut it like right here, I'm in a very tiny little circle, right? And then I'm going to have this huge equilateral triangle. Or, if I cut it first here, I'm going to have a huge circle, right? And then a little bit of wire for the equilateral triangle. Right? Okay, here's the question. Where should I cut it to have maximum total area. That means if I look at the area of this one and this one together, where should I have cut this so I get the most area possible? Does that seem like a pretty tough question? It is tough, okay? This is not an easy question. And then that's the first question I would ask. And then the second question would be the exact same thing. Where should I cut it to have the minimum total area? Do you understand the, the context of the problem? All right. What, we need to, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to create a function. And this function is going to be like a good old you know, f of x. We're going to have some function, all right? And in calculus, what we learn is how to find the highest and lowest points of a function. There is a way we can find the peaks in the valleys, the highest and lowest points on a function. So if we can somehow come up with some function that gives you the area, 
the total area, then we will be able to find its highest and lowest points using calculus. And here we can't do it yet, right? So the part of this that, re that has to do with today is can you come up with a formula that gives you the total area? That's what I want from you. So let's try and find a formula. Can we find a formula for this? Find a formula for total area. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So let's 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 start setting this up. Y'all with me? Okay. Draw a picture. Here's my wire. Has a length of L. I'm going to cut it, right? I'm going to cut it somewhere. Right there. I'm going to cut it. I don't know how, where I should cut it, right? I don't know what this value should be to give me the, the most area. So since I don't know it, I'm going to call it x. So this right here is x. You all believe that? What's the other side? What's the, how much wire do I have left? L minus x. I could have said x and y, but the reason I'm not doing y is because if I use L minus x, then I still only have one variable in the problem, right? X is the only variable at this point. Okay, good? Now, what do I do with this first chunk of wire? What do I do with this, this blue piece of wire here? What am I going to do? Bend it and make it into a circle, right? So from that, I make this circle. And then from the other piece, which is this one, I'm going to make, I said, an equilateral triangle. Equilateral means all sides the same, right? All sides the same? Can you give me a formula for the area of this? And can you give me a formula for the area of this? That's what it comes down to now, right? Because the total area, total area, is equal to the area of the circle plus, plus, I don't know what that was, plus the area of the triangle. So can you tell me what the area of the circle is? Well, everyone's going to say pi r squared, right? Pi r squared? But do you know the radius? You don't know the radius, do you? What's the only thing you know about this triangle? I mean, this triangle. Well, it's not a triangle. That's the first thing you know. What's the only thing you know about this circle? The circumference all the way around. Do you agree? That's all you know. And what is the distance all the way around? X. So all you know from this, I'm going to need more room, so I'm going to have to erase some of this. So from the, uh, I need L. So from this, you know circumference is X, right? What is the circumference of a circle by definition? Circumference is 2 pi r. 2 pi times the radius has to be equal to x. Do you all follow me? So what's the radius? x over 2 pi. Therefore, what's the area? So the area, you told me the area was pi r squared, right? So the area is pi times what's the radius? x over 2 pi pi r squared. So could I not write that as pi over 4 pi squared times x squared? Let's see if that makes sense to you. All I did was Square the top and the bottom, right? Square, square x squared. Square this, you get 4 uh, pi squared. I'm going to cancel one of the pi's. And so I get 1 over 4 pi x squared. What do you think? 
Does that seem weird or are we okay with this? I mean, you probably have never done a problem like this before. I mean, it's not. But do you follow it, what we've done? Why did the egg thank you for asking. I don't even know what you're going to ask, but thank you. <laughs> okay, what? I said, why did the eggs get a square and then the pie went on top of the egg? Okay, this pie right here, this is like a pie over one, right? So when I, squared, when I squared the x, let me rewrite this. This is like pi over 1 times, and I square the top, and I square the bottom. All right? That's, that's squaring the top and bottom. You okay with that? Now I just put these together, but I don't want the x squared up there. So I just leave the x squared here, and I just slide this underneath. And that, that becomes this. Is that, am I asking? Yes, so whatever this number is, which is some weird crazy decimal, whatever that is times the x we plug in squared. Mm -hmm. Now what did you say you were going to ask? What did I say you were going to ask? I don't know what you were going to ask. You said I knew what you were going to ask. No, no, so I don't care what you're going to ask. Thank you for asking. I'm just happy that you're asking a question. Because I, I ask, do y'all get this? Do y'all get this? No one responds. Do you get this? Do you get this? No one responds. So you f someone responded. Thank you. I don't care what you said, actually. Does that clarify what you're? OK. All right, so this is a formula right now for the area of the circle in terms of x. Look, you tell me where to cut it. You tell me where you're going to cut it. And that's going to spit out the area of the circle. OK, so in terms of this equation right here, I know that this is 1 fourth, or sorry, 1 over 4 pi times x squared. Now plus, now I need the area of the triangle. What is the area of a triangle? Well, 1 half base times height, right? 1 half <coughs> AB sine C, and then that Heron's formula, right? Any of those would work. What is it that we know about this? Is there anything we know about this triangle? All the, sides are all, the same. all the sides are the same, right? So all the sides are the same, which means all the angles are the same. And that means they're all what? 60 degrees. Now, do you know the lengths of the sides? I mean, you don't actually know them like it's not three or something like that. But you do know that you took that wire and you bent it, right, into three equal sections. And how long was that wire piece that you, t that you took? L minus X, right? And you cut it into three equal pieces. So would you agree that this side is one-third of L minus X, this side is one-third of L minus X, and this side is one-third of L minus X? Whatever the heck L minus X is, each side is one-third of it. Yeah? Okay, now, area. I have all three sides, so I could do Heron's formula. I'm not going to though, because I also have two sides and the angle between them. And if you look back at that formula I gave you, I'll do it over here. Ah, uh, no. Uh, I think it was A here, and A, and then B here, and then B, yeah. The formula of this triangle was area is one-half A, B sine of capital C, right? And I said that if you know two sides of a triangle and the angle between them, you can find the area. And we actually know two sides and the angle between them, don't we? So let's go ahead and figure out what the area of this is. The area... Is, see, what I'm trying to get at here is if you did not know this formula existed, you would be trying to find the height of this triangle. And the, finding the height of this triangle can be done, but it will add about 15 minutes to, your, to solving this problem. Because you have to do a little right triangle, Pythagorean identity, and you're gonna, it's just going to take you longer. So students in my Calculus 1 class, when I'm like, okay, hey, we need to find the area of this triangle, and I start throwing this formula out there and they've never seen it, it's, it's difficult for them, right? So that's why I'm showing it to you. So what is it going to be for us? Area is one half what? 
A times B, right? So that's one third L minus X times one third L minus X again. Sine of what? 60 degrees. And we all know what sine of 60 degrees is. Right? What is sine of 60 degrees? So you're at 60 degrees, y coordinate, root 3 over 2, right? It's root 3 over 2. So let's put all these numbers together. We're going to have half and a third and a third multiplied together. That's 1 one eighteenth. 1 eighteenth? Agreed? 1 eighteenth? But then times this, which is going to come out to be what? You'll have root 3 on top, and what on the bottom? 36. I feel like I'm losing everyone. What's going on? 1 half times 1 third times 1 third times root 3 over 2 times L minus X times L minus X. So that's root 3 over 2. I'm just going to move it out there. Move all the constants to the front. Multiply across the bottom. 9 times 4, 9 times 4. However you want to do this, 36 on the bottom, root 3 on top. Yeah. And then what do we have? L minus x squared. That's it. This is it. Root 3 over 36 times L minus x quantity squared. That's what you have to do in Cal 1 to set the problem up. And then you do the calculus. So I was just trying to show you where you could actually like see something like that. Now, can we turn the projector on? Do you know how to turn the, that thing on over there? Top left corner. I, I feel empty not to, uh, I was going to use the mouse. I was like, where the hell's the mouse? I killed it. I'm surprised if this works. That is true. So what I, what I want to do here, because I feel like I can't leave you hanging on this problem, is to actually get the answer. But we're going to do it cheating. We're not going to do calculus. We're going to graph it. So I, I'm going to leave just the I'm going to leave just this up here. And I'll remind you that this right here is the area, the total area, right, as a function of x. You give me x, and this is going to give you the total area of both objects together, right? Got to wait for this to load. Come on. Now, when I did the problem, I said the wire had a length of L, right? I actually need to, just for an example, give you a length. So why don't we make it uh, 10? Is that okay? Like, let's say it was 10 feet or 10 inches, it doesn't matter. Is that all right with you? Okay. So if it was 10, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to graph this function. 1 over... Four, I think I can just put pi, hold on. Yeah. And then x squared. And then plus square root of 3 over 36. And then we're using 10, right? 10 minus x, that quantity squared. Yes? I've got that typed in. You know, you can't see that very well. All right. Where is it? Oh, wait. Why is it? 
it's not taking this. There's a square root. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to do the square root symbol there. Where is it? Yeah. There it is. Square root, it was three? There we go. Uh, too much. That's good enough. Can you all see that all right? All right, so this is the graph of this function right here. Okay, this is it. Uh, this is a quadratic function. The highest power of x is squared. If you expand that out, that's, that's going to be x squared. So it's a parabola. And what you can see from this graph is that if x is 0, this is where we would start. That would be here. And then remember, the wire is only 10 long, so it has to stop. Here, right? And this part in here is the total area dependent upon x. Right? Where should we cut the wire to get the most area? According to this picture, where would we get the most area? If we cut the wire, where? Where? At 10. What? What the hell does that mean? What does that mean? No, look, at 10, we get the most area, don't we? Because a circle has more area. That's right, because if you take a wire and you're supposed to cut it, right, somewhere, bend one piece into a circle and the other one into a triangle, then what would give you the most area? Well, don't make a triangle. Just use the whole wire for a circle, and you'll get the most area. All right? Now. What if you wanted the minimum amount of area? According to this, you're going to have somewhere around here. It's hard to tell where that is. But somewhere, somewhere between about 3 and 4-ish, somewhere in there, you cut it, bend, or, you know, circle, triangle, you will have the minimum amount of area possible. And that area would be whatever that value is. So in the calculus class, we actually have to find out exactly where that point is. Now you can do this, you can do this with all sorts of things. You can say, all right, instead of doing a um, circle and a triangle, you could do a square and an equilateral triangle. You could compare those, right? You could do any two ge geometric objects. Um, it's interesting if you do a circle and a square, Right? If you do a circle versus a square, you come up with the same result and the circle wins. So like if you're buying a table, right, and you want to have the most area on your table with the least perimeter, then you're going you're gonna to buy a circular table. All right, this is off topic, but I mean, well, it's on topic, but I'm, go I'm about to go off topic, so I'm going to stop. All right, can you turn that off, please? Circles are good. I think this is a good point to move on to the next section. We're actually jumping in the book. Vectors. How many of you have messed with vectors already in your life? Physics or something else, yes? How many? I saw like one, two, three, four. Okay. So I'm not, I don't mean to put any of you on the spot, but uh, I will. Uh, can, can any of you like explain to the, your classmates what a vector is? It's a line with an arrow. Okay. You gotta know where it's going. Okay. So it has a direction. It has an endpoint. So I heard a line with an arrow. I heard a direction, I heard an endpoint. That's kind of on the right track. 
So let's, let's clarify some things before we start talking about vectors and, and precise definitions. Okay, if somebody gives you two points on a flat sheet of paper, two points, then there is one line that goes through both those points, right? There is a unique line that goes through both of those. So we have two points, there is only one line that goes through both. And we put arrows on the end of the, that, right? And this is called a line. All the points there create the line. Now, let's compare that to just the points between these two points. That's not called a line. It's called a line segment. It's a piece of a line, right? It's a line segment. All right, how about this? Point. Let's say another point, all the points out like that, in this direction forever, but not, yeah, that's called a ray. Now the arrow here, the arrow here implies that it goes forever, doesn't it? And this is where things get a little dangerous for us. Because when we deal with a vector, a vector is going to look when I draw it, it's going to look like a ray, but it's not a ray. Okay, so this is this point, all those points, and the arrow means all the points forever. Okay, so the, that's, that's what that is, right? Got it? Now, when we talk about a vector, a vector is a directed line segment. It's a directed line segment. That's what it is. So it's almost a line segment, but with one additional property to it. And that means it has direction. It means somehow we're going to dis distinguish between these two points like, almost like give it a, a, a direction to point in. It's either going to be pointing in this direction or it's going to be pointing in this direction. And so to do that, we will start here with the point and we will draw to another point and we would, normally we would just put that point there, but we're going to put an arrow on the end of it. So I have directed the line segment to point into a certain direction. This point right here is called the initial point and this is called the terminal point sometimes this is referred to as the tail and this is referred to as the tip the tip of the arrow the tail the feathers on the arrow on the back right Now, I, I need a way, or we need a way, to help you not make the mistake of thinking that this is a ray. So what we do is we use a special notation. And we call this vector, we give it a name. So like, we'll call it V for vector. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to label this vector with a V. But that's not enough, because V is like X. X is a variable. X is usually like a number, like X is 2, X is 5. I, don't, I want you to understand that when I say V, I'm talking about a vector. So what I do is above the V, I put this half kind of arrow. It's kind of like an arrow, but you cut the bottom of it off, all right? And that notation right there lets everybody know we are talking about the vector V. Now a lot of textbooks, what they will do to let you know they're talking about a, a vector is they will use a bold, a bold letter. The problem with that is when I'm up here on the board, I can't show you bold, right? So just realize that in textbooks, in books, they use bold, right, for vectors. Just keep that in mind.
Let's add a little more to this definition. Before I can add more, I have to t uh, define something for you. The zero vector. The zero vector. So the zero vector, as you might imagine, is a vector that has no direction to it and actually does not even have a length to it. It's just like a point. So the zero vector, we write this way, zero like this. And if I draw it, it's just basically a point. But I need the zero vector to do what we're going to do, as you're going to see. Does that make sense? It's kind of like the number zero in our number system. Like if I say, hey, look, you know, um, I have like one marker, two markers, right? Zero is a more advanced concept, actually, because zero means nothing, right? You all know that in, in the uh, evolution of our number system, you know zero came later, right? Like we got all the counting numbers first, and then someone's like, hey, this idea of zero, it came after the numbers, the counting numbers. So the zero vector is actually kind of weird that we need to define it, but we do. All right, so with that, let me continue talking more about vectors. All non-zero vectors have a length and direction. So there are two main properties of a vector that make it what it is. It's the length of the vector and the direction it's pointing in. Now, I had this only this does not apply to the zero vector. This is why I had to divine, define the zero vector because the zero vector doesn't have any length and it doesn't have any direction, but it is a vector. So if you're talking about anything that's not the zero vector, as long as it's not the zero vector, then the vector must have a length and it must have a direction. Okay? Keep going. We, this is a lot of like terminology and stuff. We got to get it out of the way before we actually do any math. All right, so all non-zero vectors have length and direction. Two vectors, non-zero, sorry, non-zero. I need to point that out. Two non-zero vectors are equivalent Is that spelled right? That doesn't look right. Yeah, it is. If they have same length and direction. Now that might seem like an obvious like Duh. I mean, they're like, they're the same length, they point in the same direction, they must be the same, they're equivalent. But this is actually a very profound, defining, like, nice thing about vectors. Let me illustrate. Let's say we have a flat sheet of paper. We've been working on a flat sheet of paper the whole class. We call that point the origin, don't we? All right, so let me draw you a vector. I'm going to make this vector, I don't know, I'm going to pick some length here, go with 8 inches, I'm going to go from here to here, point it like that, and I'm going to call that vector V, all right? Then over here, I'm going to do another vector. I feel like green doesn't get enough play here, so let me do green. Do another vector here. Same length, eight. 
and I'm going to call that U. Damn, that sucks. That is not very good. They're supposed to be parallel. I wanted them to be parallel. They look a little more parallel now to you? A little bit? OK. These are parallel. So are these vectors equivalent? Do they have the same length? Yes. Do they point in the same direction? Yes, they are parallel because I told you they were, right? So they are equivalent. And that's what, make ve that's what makes vectors special, is that if you're looking at two line segments, right, line segments, line segments would be like here, here, that's a line segment, and then I compare that to another line segment right here. These two line segments do have the same length, right? And they do point in the same direction. But are they equivalent line segments? No, because this contains a bunch of points that this one doesn't contain, right? Vectors don't care about where you are. They don't care where you are. All a vector, what defines a vector is its length and its direction. That's it. Its position in the space does not matter. So these two vectors are equivalent. You with me? Now, why, why is this important? Because let me take this example. I've got this chair here, right? And I would like to roll this chair across the room. So I'm going to grab the chair by the corner, and I'm going to apply a force, right? I'm going to apply a force, and I'm going to pull this chair, and it's going to roll, right? The whole time that I'm rolling this chair across the, the floor here, I am applying a force the whole time, right? We can visualize that force as a vector. It is in this direction, right? And its length, we could look at as being how hard I'm pulling. So if I just barely pull, it's going to be a very small vector, right? Now, as I move, is it st am I still pulling with the same force in the same direction? But it's moving, right? But it's the same force. So I need to be able to move that thing around, move that vector, that object around, and it not change, that it maintains its equivalence the whole time. So using a vector is a good way to do it. That vector's the same vector this whole time. It's the same vector, isn't it? Regardless of its position. Now if I pull with a lot of force, then the vector gets longer, right? And then that has an effect on the speed, but we're not getting into that. What I'm trying to get at is that vectors are useful for physical situations. Here's another example. So holding this book right here, right? So we could imagine two vectors here. What's one vector? Gravity. Gravity, which is pointing down, right? And the length of that is the, how could we think of the, what did you say? Mass of the, book. the mass of the book times maybe the acceleration of gravity, which would be the weight. So we can look at the weight of the book down as a vector, and then there's another force, and it's, it's an impressive force, I know. <laughs> what is it? It's the force of me pushing up on the book, right? So that force, that vector, is pointed up. How long is that vector compared to the one that's pointed down? The they're the same. Now, they're not equivalent. Hold on, be careful. They have the same length, right? But they're not pointed in the same direction. One vector pointed down is the gravity vector, or the vector of the weight of the book. The other vector is pointed up. They're in opposite directions, but they have the same length. Right? Yes? Is the vector going down longer? Would the book be going down? Yes. In this situation right here, the vector, going, the vector that would be pointing down would be longer than the vector pointed up. And then the other way around. This right here, the vector on up is more than the one down. 